Oh, it looks like it's a Gwyn Lewis dog bowl, is it? Okay, bloody expensive dog bowl, but it'll last forever. Hey everybody, welcome back. Nigel Rose, uh, Land River Channel here, and this is part two of the uh, fitting the, the, the Gwyn Lewis diff pan. And as you can see now, it's all welded up. I've literally just done it, and it's so hot I can't touch it. So I'm going to put a dirty old pair of gloves on. Um, do you know, I don't know what steel Gwyn uses, but this stuff is a joy to weld. It's lovely. Uh, really does weld like butter. You know, sometimes you get the, the horrible splattery stuff. And uh, yeah, this is welded. Just check, you can see. This is welded really, really nice. Um, you know, it's not the prettiest weld in the world because it's, it's, a, it's a high current, high wire feed, banging it in there, sort of weld. Um, but you know, it's, it's done now. The idea now is to polish all this back and get it smooth. And um, what I want to try and do is get it like, sort of like a like a one piece moulding, if you know what I mean. So basically what I'll do there is just grind it using the, the flat wheel again. And then any sort of low areas, I'll just go in with the MIG, blast them in and then basically go over again. And then when it's all painted and primed and stuff, it'll look, uh, it'll look lovely. It'll all get done gloss black. So well, I'm going to go on and get that done now. We'll get this outside all cleaned up, get it all nice and, and there we go, we'll weld it up. What I've done is gone over the uh, low spots and ground them down again. Um, really worth taking your time at this stage to get it right. What I generally do is turn the wire feed down and the voltage up a touch when you're doing the filling in. And then what you can do is just basically, you, it's almost like you're laying it on rather than, you know, when your wire feed is not enough and it all burns back, you're kind of just laying it on blobs of metal. You're not trying to achieve a weld, you're just trying to fill in little gaps. So a little, um, you know, undercuts where the, the weld doesn't quite come to the surface. So that's all done now. And then what I do is just go over the a fairly fine file, and just basically rub over just to square everything up. Now, you don't need to do this, it's not 100% necessary, but I'm kind of very fussy. Um, I'm ex Rolls Royce engineer, I think I mentioned that before. It kind of makes you very, very fussy about things. And, um, you know, I like everything to be sort of as good as I can get it, really. And the thing is, when this has got a, a shiny, of gloss black paint on it. If it's all irregular, it'll show up. So next thing to do now is go over it with a, one of those little discs I've got, and then um, and basically uh, just sort of clean everything up and get it all smooth, and then we'll do a leak test on it. Right, there we go, all done, all cleaned up and smooth and everything. And um, so there we go. We've used the grinder, then we've used the file, then we've used the little sanding disc, the little 3M sanding disc. And then just as a final touch, I've gone over with a, a sheet of fairly coarse embers and just rubbed across yeah, just to radius everything off and get it all smooth. Make it all make it all look good. And now, I don't know whether the radio came on on its own. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is just get some matte black paint. And what I'm gonna do is just go over where I've welded it. And there is method in my madness. This tin is almost empty. Okay, there is method in my madness. This is not some way of rubbing it away and making sure I can see the low spots. What I'm going to do, I'm going to fill it with acetone to, um, to leak test it. And if I've got the tiniest hairline crack or whatever in there, or the, the tiniest little inclusion, the acetone will come through and it will dissolve the paint. Now, one of the problems with acetone is, I mean, today it's a little bit colder, so it's not so much of an issue, but on a hot day, if you're in a hot climate, acetone just evaporates like that, so you won't see it. So if you put something on like that, if you've got chalk, even better, and you will see the acetone come through, and it will mark the paint where it's come through. If we don't see any marks, then we know we're okay. Okay, so I've got a couple of bottles of acetone here. Make sure you can see what I'm doing. And uh, get the camera in the middle, that's better, isn't it? And uh, yes, yeah, so acetone, so I'm just going to basically fill this with acetone. Why am I using acetone? Well, the beauty of acetone is, as I said just now, it evaporates pretty quickly. Um, and also, if it does get in the, if there is a, a crack in the weld, and it gets in there, it will evaporate, it will dry out, and it, when I come to weld it, it won't matter. If I use something like diesel or paraffin or something, it will stay wet, and then when you weld it, oops, that thing wants to come off. When you weld it, it can, um, there we go, I think that's enough. Because we'll do this again to check the weld when we do the actual 
welding it onto the axle. So I can leave that there for a couple of minutes. In fact, what I can do is with a small brush, if I can find one, I'll just use a piece of wood. What I'll do is splash this up into that joint there and then I'll see if I have got an issue in that area. Capillary action will pull it through the joint anyway because I haven't welded the inside yet. And that's why I'm doing this now. If I find a problem I can do the weld the outside and sort it. If I welded the inside and then did this I wouldn't know if it's the inside that's porous or the outside and I'd rather get the outside right first and then just weld the inside up and then we'll have to clean the outside up again obviously because we'll get all this, um, this discoloration. I'm looking under there and I can't see any moisture anywhere. So basically what we need to do now is get this out of there into here. I've got a funnel so I'll try and do it without spilling too much and then uh, we'll have a look at the other side and see what it's like. Well that wasn't much of a success at all. Uh, let's just say I've got the cleanest bench on the planet. <clears throat> As I lifted it up one of the magnets fell off. I kicked my hand and it went everywhere. <laughs> all over including all over me. Uh, so yeah I managed to um, one and a bit bottles, <laughs> probably half a bottle has gone over the bench. Anyway, never mind. Uh, but we can see that most of the paint is untouched. Uh, this bit here obviously got spilt on because it ran out the side. But um, I can see here, I'm looking around here and I can see that none of the paint has been affected at all. Um, what you would see is a, is a ring around the, the dodgy area and I'm seeing nothing at all. So um, I think we'll say that's fine. As I say, we're going to check it all again anyway when it's all when it's all on there because we need to check this weld joint here. So uh, yeah, a bit of a failure that. Probably not worth bothering with to be honest. But um, I didn't think about getting the paint out. I should have I should have thought about it before and um, maybe sort of had this sump plug a bit looser so I could have undone that and drained it out from there. Anyway, onwards and upwards they say. Right, so now we move on to welding the inside and um, as you can see I've cleaned up around where it was welded before. I was going to grind a groove into this but I'm thinking I won't bother because when you look you can see penetration in a lot of the areas so pointless grinding it away if you've got penetration there. When I go in there I'm going to basically do a little bit of a weave across and really sort of make this um, a very very strong joint indeed. Uh, notice I've got the plug now moved on to the inside so that the thread is covered. The thread on the outside is exposed but we finished on the outside now so we don't need to worry about that. So um, that's what I've got to do is get in there. I've turned the, the, um, the voltage up and I've turned the wire speed up slightly so I'm going to get in there and really sort of bang it in. The other thing to notice is if you look at this now it's kind of got a bit of a rock in it. Okay, It's only a couple of mil on either end. Um, I'm going to flatten it before I weld it on but I think actually doing this is actually going to pull it in a bit. So what I'm going to do is weld it down here first and that will help to pull it in a bit and then sort of work my way up evenly to sort of try and draw it in. Um, if, I, if I weld it here first, okay, and then that's solid, welding it here, if it draws it in it will pull it that way, if you know what I mean. So I'm going to actually use some common sense, yeah. Not a lot of that around these days. <laughs> and then weld that there. And then I'm going to go down there, down there, down there. And then go up there and up there. Okay, so I'll get myself set up and then we'll do a little bit of welding on camera. And that's that, and that'll be it then. So as you can see we've got a weld in there, um, I'm not over the moon with that, it could be a bit nicer. So I'm going to turn the current up a lot more.
we go, that's better. It's a bit of a fatter weld, as you can see there. All right, so I'll get the rest of it done, and then I'll come back. Right then, there we go. All welded up now, welded on the inside. I've given it a quick sandblast, um, just to get rid of any sort of debris that's in the corner of the welds. As I say, it's not the tidiest of the jobs here. I, I've reset the welder after there, you can see things improved. And then by the time I got up to here, you can see the welds, uh, if you can see, the welds a lot nicer. And all of a sudden, we've got two of them. Hey, <laughs> Basically, if you buy, in case you haven't seen part one of this video, if you buy the DIY diff pan, this is what you get. And it's, um, it's tack welded, the bung is welded in, but it's only tack welded, so you've got to do what I've just done and weld it all up. Which I'll be doing on this one as well, and then I'm either going to sell it or use it. I don't know what I'm going to do on the back yet. Um, so, what have I done with this? I've actually um, cut these tack rods off so I could break it in half. Yeah. Why have I done that? I've done it for you guys. Come take a look. Right, so here we are once again looking at the axle. If you remember last video, I showed you a clip with this crown wheel in this diff pan um, with the, the, the original steel diff pan on there, the standard Land Rover diff pan. Just do a clip of that now. So here's the bit I just cut off so we can remove that. And we can see inside here we've got the crown wheel, the pinions down in there, and here we've got our planet gears and our sun gears. And if you... So this being the front axle, the actual crown wheel will rotate in that direction as I'm turning it now. It feels quite rough actually. Um, so yeah, that's the way it'll rotate. So basically, you can see I've put a line here and a line here. That's going to be the oil level when it's sat normally. Okay, so the oil level is going to be around about here. So what it's going to do as it goes, it's going to push the oil up this way. It's going to push it up to feed the pinion bearings. So that's fine. The only problem is any oil that picks up here is going to come off of the crown wheel and it's going to hit there and just die. It's just going to stop because it's not going to flow. It's just going to hit that corner and just form a turbulence and not really do anything. Any oil that's down here will get pushed back and, um, and lubricate the pinion bearings. The problem comes with the rear. Now with the rear you can see that any oil that's going to be flung up off of the off of the crown wheel is going to hit here and just drop or whatever. If I think of it I'll put a link. There is a guy in America who's done this with a um, with a clear diff pan and he's actually got the car up on a truck up on the ramps and you can see what's happening as the oil hits these sharp areas. Now if we So okay so you've seen that now here we can see that when I fit the Gwyn Lewis diff pan okay so this is why I've broken this one up and I'll centre it up on these lines okay you can see how much more room we've got around the crown wheel. So, you know, you can afford to bash this, knock it, dent it, whatever. You've got much more room. Now, I know you can't see down in there very much and I can't move this back. But if I use this side that I've cut off, this would normally be here like this. But it's the same profile here as the actual diff pan. So if I put that like that and we just use all we concentrate on the outer profile, never mind the longitudinal position. If we look at that, you can see how much more room we've got. And also, like when I was talking about the oil flow, particularly for the rear, when the diff is actually going around that way, the oil spraying off is not going to be hitting this great big step. It's going to flow around there and it's being guided around. Almost like when you pour an engine, you're, you're guiding the oil around. It's going to flow up to your pinion bearing much better, in my opinion. That's not written down anywhere. It's not been tried and tested. That's just my opinion. So there we go. We can see now how much room we've got around the diff. If you remember, I couldn't get my little finger in on the last with its stock. The other thing is, because it's so much wider, what I'm going to have to do is pick the camera up and show you side on, I think. If we look here, if we look at it side on, this is the centre line and this flat part, this centre part of the diff here is 90 millimetres wide. So you can see that when it goes on, it's giving you all this room here. I, I, I'm holding it so I can't actually, but if you see to the left of that line that's marked in the centre, you've got all that room around the diff crown wheel. Whereas with, with the standard one, and this again is roughly in the centre, 
with the standard one you can see you've got no room at all I mean you can see it's really tight and it's tight here up here as well but when I take it off you can see when I lift it there's no there's no room so you know you bash that it's gonna ruin your day so um yes I've gone through all the trouble of lifting this diff up and uh, putting it up in the axle upside down for you it's a bloody nightmare so I'm just going to show you again just so that I know we've got it on record properly that here we go I fit this on here line these center lines up and there it is and you can see in there all the room we've got well you, you could see in there if I had better light <laughs> but um yeah so as I say again I'll use this because this end panel you can see here the end panel has exactly the same profile as the actual diff cover itself we can use that to see exactly how much clearance we've got around that diff and also like I say the flow so um you know I think this is a it's probably not a must-have for every Land Rover out there but if you're going off-road and I'm speaking particularly about Defender Knight Yorkney yes I am talking about you Damien um, I think this is a must-have it's a it's really really good and you can see now I'll get the welded up pan and you can see here once it's fitted once it's welded on you can see it kind of you know, because it's all smoothed out now and all the weld joints are dealt with it almost looks like it was supposed to be there so uh there we go guys the next thing i've got to do now because i've got a milling machine i'll put it up on a milling machine and i'm just going to mill this flat so that it's flat um the risk with this being like this is if you weld it like it is you you run the risk of pulling the axle because you've got a gap when you weld it always shrinks and if you've got a gap it will shrink into that gap so we need to make sure we're not going to you know give ourselves any extra work by having to straighten the axle out so what i'm going to do is stick it up on a milling machine mill this face here this back face mill this face flat then i'll put an angle back on it you could do it with an angle grinder on a flat plate um it doesn't need to be perfect it doesn't need to be a perfectly flat face it just needs to be flat so you haven't got these gaps because when you weld into these gaps here like this that's when you get things pulling so um, I'm going to have a gap there because I like to weld into a gap but it's going to basically be a 45 degree angle um, but it's going to be contacting all the way around on the inside. So I'll get that done and then we'll come back for part three. So thanks for watching this, thanks for your patience, hope you uh, enjoyed it, you may have learned a little something from it and maybe it's given you a bit of entertainment while we're all on lockdown. But um, anyway I'll see you soon for part three and part three we'll get it welded on. Bye for now and keep making those Land Rovers better as Mike says.